This morning, our passage is going to be from Psalm 88. A couple weeks ago, uh, George preached from Psalm 30, which is a psalm of thanksgiving. In contrast, the psalm this morning is a psalm of lament. Personally, I'm a big fan of Psalms of Lament. I, I think that they should be some of the most popular, uh, well-known Psalms in the church. The reality is they tend to be neglected. And I think one of the primary reasons for that is, well, quite frankly, it's easier to try to script pain out of our lives uh, than to dive into it and to process it. It's just too messy. It's too uncomfortable. We don't mind it in moderation or from time to time, but to, to stare at it, to think about it, to wrestle with it for too long a period of time, it can be frightening. It's unsettling. And so it's just easier to try to script it out of our rhythms of life. But the laments in scripture don't give us that luxury. They take hold of our pain. They acknowledge that suffering comes in different ways, in different forms. It's inevitable. They acknowledge that sometimes all you can bring before God and before others is your pain and is your exhaustion. Sometimes you simply can't fake it till you make it anymore. You're just done. And so the Psalms of Laments acknowledge that. But they go further. They say we have to do something with that pain. And one of the beautiful things about the laments is that as they encourage us to bring that pain before God, they also direct us to the reality that there is one that can intervene. There is one that can breathe life. So God is not in the business of creating cultures of mandatory happiness or comfort. And that's what can happen when we try to script laments and try to script stories of pain and suffering out of our lives, right? There becomes a sense that, man, we've got to just be happy all the time. And that's just not honest. What we find instead is that God is in the business of cosmic redemption. He's in the business of bringing the dead to life. He's in the business of bringing hope where all there seems to be is hopelessness. So this morning, we're going to dive into the pit, as it were, with this psalmist. Psalm 88 happens to be arguably the darkest and most depressing of the laments. So I do apologize ahead of time if that was not what you're expecting to go to. But my hope is that you will leave here being encouraged. So we're going to dive in this morning into Psalm 88 and see if there's not a word of life that can be found. I think it's going to be up here. Yeah. Psalm 88. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I'm counted among those who go down to the pits. I'm like one without strength. I'm set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends. You have made me repulsive to them. I'm confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness and destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, O oh Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. 
All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. Wow. That's a raw psalm. One of the most popular songs that has come our way and, and has been around since the 60s is the song, The Sound of Silence, written by Simon and Garfunkel. Very beautiful and sad song. And in it, the writer, Paul Simon, uh, is reflecting uh, on his anxieties, on his despair as a young adult. It's a psalm that would fit appropriately with this psalm. The opening lines of the song is this, Hello darkness, my old friend, I've come to talk with you again. And if I had time, I would just keep singing the rest of the song because it's a beautiful song. But lots of anxiety and despair is being reflected on in that song. Paul Simon would take about six months or so to write that. Every few days, he would average about one line. In other words, it took him a while to write that song. And it's a fitting anecdote for when we think about our grief, when we think about our despair. It's not quickly processed. It's not easily shared. And this psalm is a product of one who has been wrestling for years with his own anguish, with his own despair. This is someone that gets suffering. From the subheading, we know that the psalmist is Heman. So a couple of different accounts of Heman throughout the Old Testament and 1 Kings 4 and again in 1 Chronicles 15. So we're not quite sure which Heman this is. But we do know that he was a godly man and a man of faith. So we're going to look at three insights from this psalm and then close with God's response. And the first insight is this, that prayer essentially is clinging tightly to God. Prayer is clinging tightly to God. It is not a means of controlling your circumstances. Verses 1 and 2, you see that he begins with crying out to God. This is a prayer of lament. He cries out to God and brings before God his pain, his frustration, his anxieties, his despair, that's what cry out to God means. It's saying, Lord, help me. I'm at my end. I'm in pain. I'm overwhelmed. Help me. In verses 9 and 13, we see again, this was not a one and done event. He continually offered up his prayers before God. Lord, help me. It's interesting how in times of deep anguish and suffering, it can be tempting for some of us when we see God seemingly abandoning us uh, to script out prayer out of our lives. And I would say there's, there's two times we're in most in danger of scripting prayer out of our lives. One, when things are going really well and we feel completely in control. Two, when things are not going well at all, and it feels completely out of control. The underlying issue in both of those things is control. When we feel as if God is blessing us, it can be tempting to think, you know what, Lord, thank you for my kids. I'll take it from here. Lord, thank you for this job. Thank you for this promotion. I, I got it now. I'll take it from here. Lord, thank you for a healthy mind, a healthy heart, a healthy body. I got it. I'll take it from here. And before we know it, we've begun to sideline God. We've begun to script prayer out of our lives. Prayer, no longer as it is for this psalmist, a reorientation for him, reorienting around God and who he is. But it can be that way for us. But then you flip it, right? Things again are just out of control. And you start to wonder, well, what's the point anymore? It doesn't seem like God's really listening. 
doesn't seem like he's really heard my prayer. But in both those cases, what are we trying to do? We're trying to control our circumstances. And I'll say even further, we're trying to control what God ought to do and ought not to do. It's about control. And the psalm of lament is not just a reminder, but it's pleading with you. Entrust all things before this God in seasons of low, for sure, but also in seasons of high. When everything seems to be going well, when nothing is going well, entrust it all before him. See what he might do. The powerful thing about laments, too, is that fundamentally what they acknowledge is that if God can't do anything with this situation, no one really can. If he can't intervene in some way, nothing really can be done. And so it's constantly bringing our pain and bringing our frustrations and bringing all things before God. That's what he's doing when he says, I cry out to you, God, daily. One of the things also that I think is helpful for us to see is that prayer is not just words, right? Even as he's describing his lament, he says, sometimes all I can do is just cry. Prayer sometimes is just your tears. Sometimes it's just your sighs. Sometimes it's just your groans. Sometimes it's just your thoughts. Psalm 139, he already knows what you're thinking. He simply wants you to cling to him. And of course, prayer sometimes is singing and dancing as well. Right? It's the highs and the lows. Second insight that we hear and we see from this psalm of lament is that the experience of loss, whether perceived or real, is overwhelming. And it is life-draining. When we experience loss, whether perceived or real, it is overwhelming and it's life draining. We see this in verses 3 through 8. He's been drained of energy, drained of purpose, drained of life. And because his orientation already is around who God is, it's as if God's hand is crushing him. That the full weight of the world rather than being on God's shoulders, has been placed on his. And it's overwhelming. What's more in verse 8, and again in verse 18, we see no one seems to be able to really understand. No one gets it. No one seems to be there for him. He feels utterly alone and abandoned. And that feeling is like death. Feels like he's dying. What he's describing all throughout, though, is loss. This feeling of loss, loss of purpose, loss of intimacy with God, loss of close companions, loss of health, loss of work. And loss is a form of death. It brings us face to face with the reality that things are broken. Broken in my life, broken in your life, broken in the world. And it overwhelms us. More than that, it just drains us. And this psalmist, he just feels drained. And so the only theme that he can keep coming back to is that of death. Like, I'm just being drained of energy. It's as if I'm dying, Lord. Loss reminds us all too well of how broken things are. And as often happens in seasons of pain and suffering, going into our third insight, the questions come. And they come in full force. Verses 10 to 14, he essentially is asking, God, where are you? And if this suffering 
is your will, what possible glory can it bring you? What possible good can come out of what seems to be evil? It's deep, thought-provoking questions with no easy answers. And his rhetoric, the fact that he's not really looking for God to respond, tells us that he's not ultimately looking for answers. He's, he's looking for hope. He's looking for glimpses of hope. Let me share a personal example from my life, because to his questions, we can certainly add our own, right? Questions pertaining to the hurricanes that have happened, uh, questions pertaining to Las Vegas, questions of pertaining to campus shootings that happen, what seems to be on a regular basis. Uh, the list goes on, right? So for me, my question that I ask frequently is, Lord, why is it that when those are suffering, more suffering seems to come? I was born and raised in Sierra Leone, West Africa, and in 93, our family uh, fled uh, to the States. That's how I sort of ended up in Pennsylvania. And we fled because the Civil War had broken out. And I don't know if some of you remember that time, but on the cover of Time and World Magazine, things like that, would be pictures of children and adults whose arms had been chopped off and all of that was in the context of Sierra Leone, right? Rebel soldiers were doing that in order to try to make a statement. So that was the war that we were fleeing out of. Finally, early 2000s, the war ended. And since then, it's just been years of recovery, years of rebuilding. Well, in 2014, my family and I decided to go back and visit family and what would happen? But the Ebola virus would come out of nowhere, one of the most deadly diseases in the world, and would take the lives of hundreds living in Sierra Leone and living in neighboring countries as well. And just so we get a sense of just how devastating such a situation can be, especially in a place that's under-resourced, a place that gets overwhelmed in the hospitals, a place that's understaffed, Right. In the States, there are about 250 physicians for every 100,000 people. In Sierra Leone, there's about three. So when something like that happens, your first thought is, there's no hope. A month ago, or maybe two months ago now, a large mudslide out of nowhere early in the morning, around two or three in the morning, came and destroyed hundreds of households, again in Sierra Leone. So folks have gone to sleep, planning their day, never woke up. And kids woke up without mom or dad around. And so I can't help but ask, what glory, God, can that give you? To what end? And that's just one example. That's just my own personal examples. There are hundreds, there are thousands of examples like that, right. of questions that are just coming with no easy answers. But again, even in my own questions, what I'm realizing is that it's not answers I'm looking for, it's hope. It's not answers that folks in Las Vegas are looking for. It's hope. They just want their loved ones back. So for those of you in that season of life now where all you have are just questions, these laments are for you. They offer our words when we have none. They offer thoughts when we're not sure what to think. And they offer action when we're not sure what to do, and it begins with entrusting it before God. To those of you with family members or loved ones in this season of life, or you know of folks that all they have are questions, you're not sure what to do, remember your primary role is not to rationalize them through their pain 
or anxieties is to simply be present. In his book, Finding Lost Words, Jeffrey Harper makes this following comment. When with those who are suffering, please don't say it's not really so bad, because it is. If you think your task as comforters to tell me that really all things considered, it's not so bad, you don't sit with me in my grief, but you place yourself off in the distance away from me. Over there, you have no help. What I need to hear from you is that you recognize how painful it is. I need to hear from you that you are with me in my desperation. To comfort me, you have to come close. Come sit beside me as I grieve. The laments are powerful rhythms for us personally and then also us as a body, right? It's very easy to judge one another without even hearing each other's stories, without knowing the highs and lows that people are going through. It takes time. It takes intentionality to know someone. And in so doing, we learn how to be present with each other. So that brings us now to God's response, because as you can see, in the psalm, nowhere do we see God's response. That's what makes this the darkest of laments. Most other laments, there's some word of hope that kind of breaks in, but not with this one. So I would argue that God's response is twofold. One, it's silence. We don't naturally think of his silence as comforting. Partly because for us, when we experience the silence of loved ones, it can feel like abandonment. And the hardest thing to believe in moments when you feel abandoned is that God is there with you. To think that he's not only heard you, but he grieves and suffers with you. If all we had was this psalm, Psalm 88, then that would be true. It is hopeless. There's nothing that can be done. The end. If all we had was this psalm. But in the context of Scripture, when we realize that God's grace had come long before this psalmist and continues on even in that pit of despair and continues on long after, despair doesn't have the last word. Left in isolation, it is believable that God's not there. But in a context of God's redeeming narrative, you can believe and know that he is there with you. He does grief with you when you're in that season, in that moment. And emphatically, we know this because of the cross. The cross, in some ways, can be seen as God's response to our laments. Psalm 88 is right, right, that loss, form of death, death itself overwhelms us, right? But I would go further and say it conquers us. And we see it, we see it every day. We see forms of death all the time. We see it in wars. We see it in genocides. We see it in suicides. We see it in mental illness. We see it in sexual abuse. We see it in human trafficking. We see it all the time all these different forms of death and we can't help but wonder with tear stained eyes does it have the last word God if you are the author and sustainer of life where are you and at the cross we see his power on display although it can seem like it was a foolish thing to do why would you lay down your life for a creation that rebels against you. And even more, 
why would you do battle with death? Don't you know, God, that death conquers? And we get an interesting word in 1 Corinthians 1, 18. The cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. And what is that power? John 3, 16 and 17, well-known passage. For God so loved the world, for God so loved you, that he sent his Son Jesus, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. The power of God, in other words, is the life-giving work of his son in his death and resurrection. The power of God is the pouring out of his Holy Spirit that you might know and believe who has the final word. He laid down his life. He took on the full weight of the consequences of your sin and my sin. He does battle with death itself. And at the end of it all, all death can do is cower back. And here's a picture of it that we see. This is from Matthew 27. As Jesus was on the cross, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, who had died, were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the city and appeared to many. Matthew gets so excited about the power of the cross that he couldn't help but insert into that comment, even as he's explaining Jesus dying, that, wait, but it doesn't end there, because soon after he rose again from the dead, people began to rise from the dead and visit loved ones as witnesses that death didn't have the last word. What a thought that a loved one who would have recently died would come to my door they saw. I don't know what's happened, but I'm alive. It will leave you speechless. It will leave you unsure of what to think or believe. But that's the power of the cross. It's meant to leave you speechless. It's meant to leave you overwhelmed with hope. Christ Resurrection was the beginning of the end of pain and suffering and death. And in this pouring out of his spirit, we see the hope of God, the hope of the gospel, already being planted in seed form, right? Beginning in Judea, Jerusalem, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Even in our own lives, we already begin to see some of the fruit of that hope. And in his return, we will see his kingdom fully manifested. A kingdom where death no longer reigns. A kingdom where death will be no more. A kingdom where sin no longer exists. So till he comes again, we remember. That's the reason why communion comes at this time. It's because as we come after a long week, we are exhausted. And for those of us who have had a great week, we come remembering that his grace was what was at work. But we come to remember that this Christ, whose body was broken for us, whose blood was shed for us, that this Christ lives. This Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who went into that pit of despair, lives. That he has poured out his Holy Spirit. So that you and I might know that death doesn't have the last word. First Corinthians 15, let me close with this passage. 
But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised and our preaching, then this time is in vain and your faith is in vain. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. And those asleep, those who have already died, who have, who have fallen asleep in Christ, have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we, meaning followers of Christ, are of all people to be most pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Soon shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? We're boasting. This passage is a call to the people of God to boast in Jesus. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This Jesus is light in the darkness, and he is life when life feels to be drained out of you. And he's hope when all seems hopeless.